In the previous sequence, we saw together the particularities of attention deficit in the context of 22QDS and how it could have an impact on learning. In this sequence, we will see which treatment seems to be effective for attention difficulties in 22QDS. First, it can be said in general that the interventions that seem to work in the developmental attention disorder are also effective in the context of 22QDS. Thus, in this context, one can refer to the general international guidelines for treatment of ADHD. Intervention must, of course, be adapted to intellectual, physical, and psychological particularities of 22QDS. We will come back to this specifically in each section of the video. In general, it can be said that regardless of the age of the child, before or after six years of age, the first interventions are always aimed at ensuring that the child and parents understand the nature of the attentional difficulties and are able to implement a certain number of adaptation. It is also important that the child and the parent understand what attentional difficulties are and how they manifest themselves. For example, in the ability to adjust to everyday life or learning. It is therefore essential that the young person concerned, his or her parent, siblings, and possibility the school environment be able to understand the manifestation of the attention disorder in this child. This is often referred to as psychoeducation. In the next short video sequence, a mother of a young teenager will explain us the importance for her boy to understand his own difficulties in order to fully participate to the treatment that is effective. Tell us about um, the, the process of him understanding his attention problem. How did that contribute to the overall process? Um, we call it psychoeducation, right? Yeah. Um, I'd say initially he... Th there was a big difference between he started with Ritalin, which was a short-term benefit. He didn't like the feeling of that. Um, with the long-term, slow-release medication, he was less affected by that. He's more comfort he was more comfortable with that. So I stopped giving him Ritalin because he just didn't like it. Um, I think he very quickly felt the benefits. So, for example, the first thing I noticed was one day he was trying to get his trottinet into the boot of the car. And on the medication, he took everything out of the car, rearranged the boot of the car and put the trottinet in. And he was very proud of that. And I can see now in the morning, he now asked me for his medication before he goes to school because he can see or I can see in him, it gives him this independence, which in turn gives him more confidence. And in the last month, for example, we've since we've augmented his medication, I can see he's got his taekwondo belt, which is not a direct result of it, but he's able to practice. He's been able to follow the plan of practicing every day, and he's now more motivated to take it. Depending on the age, adaptation of the material and the environment will be made. Psychopharmacological intervention is also considered when attention difficulties are considered in children six years and older. Pharmacological intervention can rarely be considered for a younger child when there are marked attention difficulties with major functional impairment. Depending on the situation, in school-aged children or adolescents, additional psychotherapy may be indicated. Now let's look with Joanna Meder at environmental adjustment and different intervention in more details. To support young people with ADHD, various accommodation at home and at school can be considered. We can mention three general principles. First of all, structure the environment. 
the workplace should be arranged to promote concentration and working session schedules in advance with appropriate portions of material for the attention span. Secondly, think about how instructions are given. Keep instructions clear and simple. Giving multiple instructions at the same time can create an overload. If necessary, instructions can be written down. Finally, make positive comments on the attitude or work of the individuals and emphasize progress, even if it seems small in comparison to other young people. A more complete selection of suggestions made specifically for individuals with 22Q is presented in a dedicated sequence of the MOOC. Additionally, to the accommodations made to the environment, we can also consider special training of certain cognitive processes through tasks to improve attention or executive functions. This is called cognitive training. There are numbers of tools that have been developed specifically based on the needs of individuals with 22Q. You can see them displayed on the screen. Other authors have evaluated the effectiveness of existing intervention programs, but not specifically thought for individuals with 22Q. All these interventions show promising and encouraging results, but for the moment, the improvements are restricted to laboratory tests. We see that the skills trained in a certain context are not used in another context. That is to say, there is little transfer of the trained skills into everyday life. This problem is common to many intervention programs, and to remedy it, interventions need to target as closely as possible what young people need on a day-to-day -day basis. Only then will individuals use these new skills automatically in their daily lives. To resume, so far, we have talked about non-pharmacological interventions. We have seen the importance of explaining difficulties to parents and young people to help them better understand how ADHD manifests. We have also discussed general accommodations that can be made to improve attentional skills or partially compensate the lack of them. Finally, specific cognitive interventions or cognitive training programs targeting attention and executive function show promising results However, further research is needed. In the next part, Professor Stéphane Eliès will talk about which psychopharmacological treatments are available to improve the attention span and reduce the associated difficulties. Today, it is considered that the first-line medication, referring to the type of medication which is chosen in the first place, is a prolonged efficacy form of the molecule called methylphenidate. This is the same molecule that was invented in 1943 and originally branded Ritalin in the first short-acting form. Today, there are different brands of long-acting form of the same molecule that change their name depending on the country and the duration of action of the molecule. What is important is that the medication can be delivered throughout the day long enough to be effective during the hours when the child is in school and doing homework or other activities that require fully concentration. So ideally, one pill once a day, effective the entire day. Thus, often in children, we give a form that will be effective at least eight hours from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. In teenager, when homework and homeschool preparation becomes more important, we will tend to give a form with a prolonged efficacy that lasts 10 or 12 hours until 6 or 7 p.m. in the evening. When methylphenidate does not seem to be effective, even though it has been prescribed at a sufficient dosage, or when it causes side effects that are not tolerated, then another molecule can be chosen. However, it has to be noted that to date, there is only sparse information on the treatment of attention problem in 22QDS with other molecules than methylphenidate. Typically, the second line recommendation today is lisdexamphetamine or another form of dexamphetamine. Again, if this molecule is not effective or sufficiently effective, or if the side effects are also problematic, a third-line molecule alone is chosen. In general, two drugs are considered, guanfacine or atomoxetine. These 
Third line molecules can also be prescribed in combination, for example, a psychostimulant like long acting form of methylphenidate and guanfacine in combination. This reduces the side effect or increases the effectiveness of the first or second line medication. When no treatment option has given a satisfactory result, it is useful to be able to refer the child or adult to an expert center for a second opinion. As far as effectiveness is concerned, when the medication is prescribed at a sufficient dosage, psychostimulants have shown to be effective on more than 80% of children and adolescents with attention difficulties. When we switch to a second line, we also have 80% effectiveness. It is therefore rather rare to have to switch to a third line. It may be that the medication is slightly less effective in 22QDS, but the sample size of the studies are not large enough today to be certain about this. In our clinical experience, we generally observe a comparable response to medication of attention problem in the context of 22QDS. In the next video sequence, let's see together what a mother observed about the medication effectiveness on her 13-year-old teenager. One thing you notice is in conversation, he doesn't cut people off anymore. He waits his turn. So it's easier to talk to him. Uh, he's much more observant about things in general, starts conversation. And that was one of the things we worked on. We had reached the end of our goal. We didn't re couldn't realize it without, was initiating things. So he initiates things and that gives him confidence. Planning in a calm way. Um, he organizes his own school bag. He doesn't forget his fish anymore. And that has a knock-on effect. So it might be that he knows how to do the maths problem that he learned in school today, but he forgot the fish. And before the 10 minutes it would take to find the fish and the anxiety. The fish in English would be. Oh, the, the, the maths problem, the book. Mm -hmm. So he would know how to do the book, the maths problem, but he would have forgotten the book in school. And before he starts his homework, there would be 10 minutes of anxiety around finding the book or calling someone to get a copy of the book. So by the time he sits down to do the problem, he's already anxious. So that now is removed. So he comes home and starts his homework by himself. Whatever the form of medication introduced, it is necessary to introduce the medication very gradually by making increments every two to four weeks before moving on the next dosage. The advantage of being able to progress step by step is to allow a good evaluation of the efficacy of a given dosage, but also to avoid side effects that may lead the child to not want to take the medication that may be useful to him. This is all the more important since if the medication is effective, it is likely to continue during an important period of his schooling and training. However, there are also common side effects of these medications. Although most are transient, they must be carefully monitored and may lead to a change in medication. Since side effects are often dose-dependent, a gradual introduction of the medication is always recommended. The most common adverse effects are digestive disorder and decreased appetite, headaches, and sleep disturbances. In this table, we see that the most common side effects in the context of microdeletion 22 are also those found in the general population receiving the medication. These include a decrease in appetite in almost 90% of the children and adolescents, headaches and digestive discomfort in about 50%. Other observations such as mood changes or sleep difficulties occur in 50 to 40% of the cases, but could also be attributed in part to the microdeletion itself. Indeed, in general, side effects appeared with each dose increase and tend to persist for a few weeks to a few months, sometimes even longer. As this treatment can cause digestive disorder and decrease appetite, weight stagnation can be caused by the prescription of the medication. 
especially during the first year. Weight stagnation, especially in children, can be particularly reduced by a window of no medication during weekends and school vacation. The same author showed that the intensity of these side effects, although frequent, were rather mild, especially after six months of treatment. However, in the context of 22QDS, the side effects that will require special attention is the possibility, although exceptional, of psychostimulants inducing cardiac rhythm disorder. For this reason, a control echocardiogram is recommended once the medication has been introduced. Many authors have questioned the potential risk of inducing psychotic symptoms by prescribing psychostimulant medication to individuals affected by 22Q11DS. Despite all the careful observation made so far, no study has shown psychotic symptoms induced by the prescription of the psychostimulant. However, as the size of these studies are still limited, almost exclusively with methylphenidate, vigilance in prescribing with regards to the appearance of psychotic symptoms must be continued. Finally, the necessary precaution and attention to prescribing must not lead to the prescription of an insufficient dose of the medication. Indeed, if the dosage of the medication is not sufficient, the child or adult will not be supported effectively. He or she will continue to present difficulties in concentration, distractibility or fatigue during work, which in turn will have a significant impact on his or her learning and skill development. In case of doubt or uncertainty, it may be worthwhile to conduct the introduction of this medication with the support of a center with expertise in developmental disorder, ADHD, or microdeletion 22. Nevertheless, it can be difficult for a parent considering medication for attention problems. Let's see what a mother says specifically about her consideration in regard to this question. At what point um, did you consider a medication? Uh, 10, age 10. So he was sank, no, it was nine because he had four years ago. So um, in a way you could say, okay, that was um, already two, two years that it was very obvious. Why did it take so much time to get the medication? Um, there's a reluctance at such a young age. With was it from your on your side, you mean? Or the school or the therapist or your child? It was a combination of both. We chose our the ergotherapy route and we had exhausted the goals that we'd set for that route. And it was agreed at the start that we'll we'll try this first. So we were back to our conversation about so we were quite specific understanding about planning autonomy and autonomy was a big thing we were going for to it became more important in school for him to be independent and with the therapy we didn't get there we just didn't meet those goals and so we looked at medication so finally you could say that it's once you saw that the other routes were sort of exhausted uh, that you switched over and you used medication exactly um, now, if you could rewind time, was that the right way to do it? I don't think so. I think, no, I would have started earlier. Why? It's, he's already working at his limits. So you said you waited too long, too much at the limit or beyond the limit. Yeah, what? and because... I've seen how he can succeed with the medication and what is the most important is to maintain his confidence and when he achieves things it's accumulative, it gives him more confidence and gives him more independence and it's a cycle that grows and when he was younger, five, six or seven, it was a cycle that was descending and when he's 
when you've when he's lost, if you like, when he isolates himself, when he's demotivated, when he's it's very difficult to get him back. Mm -hmm. At the time, and I would do now, I wouldn't want to put him in that place because I know what you lose to 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 get him back. Now that we have seen the types of medication that can be prescribed and how to prescribe them, let's see with Joanna Meder what effects they can have on cognitive function. We have established that stimulant treatment is indicated to treat ADHD symptoms in 22Q when they are causing significant impairments. However, studies evaluating the effects of stimulants, specifically in 22Q, are still very scarce. The work of an Israeli research group was the first to show that stimulant treatment in a group of people with 22Q is well tolerated and safe for both cardiac symptoms and psychosis symptoms. They have also shown that stimulant treatment lead to a significant reduction in ADHD symptoms and improvement in cognitive processes of attention and executive functions. These results were replicated by an independent group from the University of Geneva also showing good tolerance of the treatment with, as we have seen previously, frequent but low intensity side effects. The results also confirm a decrease in core ADHD symptoms and a specific improvement of attention and inhibition skills. What these studies have in common is that they include a small number of participants, probably for two main reasons. First, 22Q is a rare genetic disease and therefore it takes a long time to enroll a large group of patients in a study. Second, clinical trials to evaluate the effect of a treatment are very difficult to conduct and require a very large commitment for patients and their families, but also for researchers. Despite these difficulties, we are confident that future research will focus on providing empirical evidence to guide the network of caregivers and families caring for individuals with 22Q. In conclusion, in this sequence, we have provided some ground suggestion that can be helpful for affected individuals and discussed treatment option for attention difficulties specific to 22QDS, behavioral interventions and strategies to support learning despite attentional difficulties are in the forefront. We saw that cognitive training can be a useful option and that medication can be particularly effective. Finally, we ended by looking at the effect of medication on cognitive function and attention. It is obvious that a lot of research is being conducted on the subject and that these results will evolve and that new knowledge, perhaps new treatments, will complete these results in the years to come. To finish the current sequence on ADHD and 22QDS, we propose to listen to the testimony of a mother and what she has learned during the process leading to the treatment of her son's attention problem. Anything you'd like to say beside all this on all this process from going from diagnosis to effect of treatment? I think it's important to note um, that I think the timing socially is really important for him. In what, what way? Well, he was on the medication before he went into a bigger school where, so he was on the medication where before he went into what would be secondary school. So he was already on the medication when he was facing changes, changes of classroom, new people. That first year of school was the year where you make friends, you find a group. It's a year where you become very independent or you're expected, there's a lot of independence expected of him. He would not have achieved those things without the medication. So I think it was really important to look at how he sort of builds the foundation of his social life, of his being independent, of being a teenager, and how important this medication has been to help him do that. So, for example, getting the bus every morning by himself with his earphones, having taken the medication, being independent, has meant he makes friends, he can ask them for homework, 
and that's building the foundations of his social life. And that's really important. And if you don't hit that at the start of the year, in the correct calendar year, you're putting him in a situation where he's got to catch up and he already has to catch up. It's already difficult for him. So I think it's important to think about those timings. Okay, last question. If you, you are now in the present, if you could give yourself an advice about ADHD in your child five years ago, what would you tell yourself from your current perspective? Mm. What have you learned and what would you li have liked to know at the time five years ago when he was eight, seven or eight about ADHD? To really understand his limitations and how he processes information and what his experience is so you can understand how far you can expect him to go, what you can do with therapy, what needs to be done with medication, um, to really see things from his perspective. Um, that's what I would have preferred to know. I think we could have gained time if we'd started earlier. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome.